Before we jump into the episode, I have to tell you about the newly renovated Sub-Zero Wolf and Cove showroom in Scottsdale. They've partnered with over 16 local designers and cabinet companies, of which I know most of them. I can say that this really helps give the immersive experience for anybody wanting to visualize their future kitchen. It's a place to start, experience, and bring your vision to life. Product experts assist you throughout the entire project, view an array of options, and see them in full-size kitchen vignettes. Turn knobs, open drawers, ignite flames, determine the best fit for you. Chef-led demonstrations provide the opportunity to ask questions of the experts that use them every day. Schedule your appointment at subzero-wolf.com backslash Scottsdale, or you can call 480-921-0900. Your brand experience is such a paramount part of helping you close those sales. So this isn't just about like having a pretty face. This is about, you know, walking the walk, defining your values, and ensuring that you're telling the best visual story to support all of those components, the complexity of what your brand is and what your brand stands for. So welcome today to Construction Podcast. Today we have Sarah Schultz with us. Welcome, Sarah. Hey, thanks, Brad. I appreciate you having me on. Excited to have you on. I've known Sarah for a while now through, you know, Morgan at Construction and Style. And Sarah has HeySarahSchultz.com, which your website's phenomenal. We'll talk about Thank that a little you. bit. It's very engaging. I love it. And then you're also the owner and founder of Free Afternoon, which is a creative agency. And um, news that I just found out actually a couple of minutes before I get on the podcast is that um, you're with Prada now. We, I have a client, Aspen X, out of Aspen. They're an emerging luxury ski brand. And they did a collab with Prada. And I just got off a plane from Aspen. We were just shooting a campaign with Prada at 12,000 feet. I hauled my 34-week pregnant self up the mountaintop, (laughs) and uh, we made it happen. It was just such a crazy cool experience, and seeing the assets that we created with the team go live on not only AspenX's website and socials, but also on Prada is pretty bonkers it's so cool to see it's so cool to see so so walk through that i mean we're i of course you have an amazing brand i mean just a quick background you, you've spoken i've heard you speak you're an amazing energetic speaker you have tremendous talent so you've done these amazing designs you came out and you spoke you know at our summit that we had in huntington beach but you know go you know how do you even get introduced to like prada and aspen x and now you're doing this incredible collaboration yeah i so i worked with the coo of aspen x years ago Um, we know each other through previous corporate career and actually, oddly enough, when I was out speaking at the, at the conference, um, with you guys, I said, Hey, I'm in town. Let's meet up for dinner. And, uh, my, my colleague's name is Darcy and Darcy was saying, you know, here are all the big things around brand that as COO, I need to try to get off the ground, make an impact to land within the community in Aspen to, tell the story that we want to tell to make this the brand we know that it can grow to be. Um, Here are some of my pain points. I just looked at her and I said, Darcy, this is what I do every day for brands. This is what my team does every day. We can help you. And that's how much of a whirlwind it's been. Whirlwind it's been. So Brad, you and I were together, what? A month ago. ago? Yeah. Yeah, Four weeks ago. Yeah. So in that four weeks, (laughs) we figured out our contract. We figured out scope of work. We booked flights. Uh, I got some other team players involved. We flew out to Aspen. We put the creative brief together. We put the campaign together. Um, the the team, the internal team at Aspen X had, of course, done a lot of the, the pre-work there, but they really just needed the finessing and kind of some final touches to make sure that the campaign landed. I hit the ground running, heads down, just super focused, got the rest of the brief together, everything from, you know, what do we want this to feel like? What do we want this to look like? What's the messaging? And we hiked up a mountainside and shot that campaign and it's already live. Like the tr- the whole thing, considering we had our first conversation four weeks ago and the campaign is live right now is I think the power of, of you know, when you really want to dig in and get something done, you just make it happen. And that's exactly what we did. That's exactly what we did. Sarah, I mean, I could break this. But it's been this. crazy. Yeah, I could break this apart so many ways because what's amazing is, is on one hand, right, you're, you're networking, right? Which is super important. You have connections, but you're optimizing that. You're at another event in Southern California. You're reaching out to a colleague that you had a history with. You're at dinner. Okay, we're, we're networking. Opportunities there. Door slides open. 
bam, Sarah's like, I'm 34 weeks pregnant. Doesn't matter. I want to help you. And here we are in a month. And it's, again, you have another business you're running. You have other complexities. Speak to just like the organization, you know, that you have or with your team to be able to optimize an opportunity that presented itself such as this one just four weeks ago. This is such a fantastic question because I think a lot of people who are getting into business or they've been in business for a while, processes and systems, to me, a person like me, a creative, are the least sexy things that I could be talking about, but the most critical things to allow me to run my business successfully and allow me to play that key role that I'm the best at. I needed, I have a director of operations, Tiff, who's fantastic. I needed her to help me build this back end out so that I could go do all the things that I love doing. And so, you know, I have a team, there's five of us on my team. And I knew that everything else that was in the works would totally be taken care of. Our other clients would be nurtured. All of that other workload would be attended to by the team giving me time and space to go and tackle this crazy turnaround, but dream experience that I just couldn't pass up. And really because the business has the backbone that it has, and I have the team that I have that allowed me to really coordinate with my healthcare provider to make sure, okay, are we cool with me going up this mountain right now? Right. (laughs) Coordinate with my husband and daycare and, you know, taking care of our toddler. Hey, if I leave next week, or is that good? Those were the logistics I had to worry about. I didn't need to worry about the rest of the business. The business was fine. Everyone's in great hands. So I got to take a take a totally whirlwind project on and we're going to continue work together, which is so exciting. This is the stuff that just you dream of doing and here I am doing it right now. So what's really interesting about your comments there is I didn't anticipate the context of this conversation going this way on the podcast today. Um, but you break down systems, right? And what's what's always fascinating me is it's one thing I struggle with, and I think most of us that are entrepreneurs, right? We, you and I have a, a way we operate, right? And maybe you're a type personality, maybe you can handle certain complexities, but trying to get information out of your head to others is really difficult. To create systems is tough. It's really tough, you know, for a builder to create systems in this chaotic atmosphere we build in. But a creative person, whether it's from the arts or marketing or architecture design. It is really hard. And it's very rare that you find someone that has like the systems in line as well as the creative side because creative people like are creative for a reason and it's hard the system yes. side. So uh, speak about that journey. I mean, you have five employees and you could have the faith that, hey, you guys can handle this. Well, now I'm going to Aspen. You know, how did that build itself? Because I, I imagine it wasn't like that always. No, it certainly wasn't like that always. And really early on in, in my business, I've been running my business for 10 years, full time in business for five. And I really early on knew, even from my corporate career, I had, you know, some great foundational setup. I led a team and I, it's, it quickly, I quickly learned throughout just, you know, being in the professional workforce, I'm really great at some things and I'm not great at other things. And instead of trying to focus on fixing those things I'm not so great at, I find partners and and a team and support, whatever that looks like, to help me where I'm not going to be great ever. And I focus on continuing to drive and improve the things I'm already good at to keep soaring with those strengths. And so that was a behavior that has just been ingrained in me in my entire you know personal life, professional life that has served me so well. So yeah, those I look back at the early stages of taking on clients when it was just me and how probably terrible that client experience was, or maybe the client didn't even know, you know, maybe the client didn't even know that that was terrible, but Brad, you're right. Creatives are creative for a reason and they're not good at these other touch points. And so I knew right away, I knew what my business goals were. I knew I wanted to be a million, multi-million dollar brand. I knew I wanted to be a presence in the space. I knew I could not do it alone. I was not going to get there just relying on my creative abilities. And I think that's also something that's fascinating as I've learned and I'm working with other creatives. It can be really hard to work with a creative team. Right. Yeah. It can be very challenging because their gifts are, like you said, pulling out these amazing ideas from their head and bringing it 
to reality and not necessarily the rest of the processes or experience or the client touch points that ultimately make a huge difference. And that was something that was just super important to me to try to figure out. And I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it. I needed to find the people to help me get there. It's interesting you say that because um, I know as I think through this creative side, working with other creatives, I mean, speak to this event in Aspen, how in a month, what are the deliverables you have to put together and thinking about going up a mountain? I mean, some of the aspects from, you know, the advertising and filming, and I'm sure just all the elements that go into this in just a short time. It was crazy to say the least. Like I said, the internal Aspen X team had done some of the foundational stuff. So like the photographer and the stylists um, were already coordinated. Like they had those key partners, but they were really looking for a creative, a true creative director to come in and help support them on like, okay, cool. But like, what's the vision? Where, what are we going to, how are we going to run with this? Where are we going? And so I honestly just got to step in to my best skill set. It was like this job was made for me. I mean, it was the universe just spoon feeding me the most perfect thing that just flows out of me naturally. And I was able to identify a couple gaps I thought we needed to fill. The biggest thing that I coordinated was bringing a videographer on. I said, if we're going to film or if we're going to shoot this campaign, video is everything right now. It'll be important to get photo, of course, but we have to capture video and create really great video assets to use on social, to use for ads, to use on the website. And so I coordinated with a videographer I use all the time, Kaylee Lemoyne. She was out in Huntington Beach with me. She is just such a fantastic creative as well. And you know, we've worked together so many times before. And so I can say, Hey, this is what I'm thinking. And she just, she knows it and she films it and makes it happen. And so it's, it's wild. Again, I keep saying like wild and crazy because it came together so effortlessly. It was a lot of work and it, and it took a lot, but I think it speaks to, again, this is a natural skill set of mine. So the, the work flowed out of me very just efficiently and it felt good and I knew I was on the right path and we got approvals from Aspenex quickly. We got approvals from Prada quickly because I was in true alignment with what I'm supposed to be doing. And I have a great network of partners that I knew, hey, here's some gaps. These are the things that we need to solve for that we were able to just make it come together really fast. Now, that's not sustainable. Like I'm exhausted. That was a wild, <laughs> <laughs> that was a wild seven, seven nights. Yeah. Um, really, really long days. I, I won't work that way all the time. It just doesn't make sense. But it was pretty magical how it all came together. And um, I think that, again, speaks to having the skill set I have and, and that I was in true alignment with my work and my skills and having a team to help support bring that to life and a network to help bring that to life. It's, and, a, it's, it, excuse me. It certainly wasn't just me. It certainly wasn't just me. Oh, there's no doubt. And you mentioned, you know, the network you've had, Sarah, I mean, speak to that just, the uh, you know, and, and we'll get into the branding aspect and some of the amazing things you're doing, you know, and, and how we break that down. But, you know, network is something that can't be overlooked, right? I look at the value of, you know, your network that you have, Sarah and mine, and, you know, there's different connections. And a lot of people say, well, I'm lucky. And you may laugh at that, say I'm lucky, but the reality is you're creating a lot of your own luck because, there's a lot of years and relationships and hard work and time and to your craft Absolutely. and dedication. And then things kind of align. You optimize that, they align. And, and essentially, this isn't a lucky thing that happened in Aspen. It's circumstance due to years of progression, right? So you yes. know, speak to the value of relationships you've, got, you've had and built in your career. I am so grateful for those relationships. I I, I've realized that in transitioning out of a traditional corporate setting where I'm always in an office and I'm always surrounded by a core team, whether it was a team I built or a team that was I just you know became a part of, when you go off to start your own business, some of that camaraderie evaporates quickly and you need to rebuild that team or network or colleague base. And it, entrepreneurship is a lonely road unless you do that. A lot of us come into building businesses with a big vision and dream and idea. It's like 
the the big picture thing and we figure out along the way like how the heck am i going to make this happen how does this actually come to life and we don't necessarily necessarily know that map um for me building a network of who's mostly been women in business in a similar stage of their life that i am in has been absolutely paramount to my business success and i love what you touch on is that I agree with you fully. It is not just luck. What what these colleagues are pouring into me, I am also pouring into them. I am also cheering for them and their successes. I am also making connections of, oh, hey, you need this type of person. I know this person. Let me connect you to the power of having a strong network, a strong referral network is immeasurable. I, I can I can track almost you know, these touch points that at the time didn't make sense, but looking back, okay, well that yes, that I said that connected me to this person brought me to this job, which that brought me to these three jobs and those two I didn't love, but this one I loved and this job, it is, it is so clear that those people are the reason, you know, of course, in conjunction with my participation in said relationships or projects or client work, et cetera that have just continued to propel me down the path and building that a team, your Avengers, the people that you love to pour into and they love to pour into you as well is one of the key reasons that I've been as successful as I have been. And honestly, I know are going to help me continue with successes moving forward in my business. I I, I love that. I love the couple of, Things that you touched upon there, Sarah. And what's interesting is, you know, as someone who's trying to grow their business, you know, we have a lot of entrepreneurs and small businesses that listen to this podcast. And, you know, for you, you have experience in corporate America. You've you've built an amazing brand. You have a great personality. It's easy, you know, that you know people speak to you and they're you're very engaging. And so, it, it you know, you, I feel like you have a u- unique advantage there. And I was asking Morgan, I'm like, hey, how did you meet Sarah? And she's like, we met through Instagram, and some of my best friends are through Instagram. And you know, then I met her, and I see her energy and her drive and her passion. And and then, like you said, you're cheering for each other. You're building this up. You know what? If you were looking now, if you were starting your company now, you maybe didn't have the corporate America. How would you how would you seize that opportunity to have connections and make network? Because as you mentioned, it's not just a one sided thing. You're bringing value to them. You're cheering them on. You know, entrepreneurship's a lonely road. So, what advice would you have to someone that's looking to increase their network? I I lead with as much genuine authenticity as possible, and. I think authenticity is this like joke of a word. It's been used so much, especially with the birth of social media. And then we have catfishing, right? And you can just, you can be this fake person. It is easier than ever to be the the most fake person in the entire world and put on this persona. I knew from an early age in life that if I just embrace who I am and feel proud of that and let that person shine the loudest, that has been like moths to a flame, bringing the right people right on in. And the people who don't love the energy or who don't love that I use swear words or that (laughs) that don't love some of these components of really who I am very naturally, they're off to find their people faster. And I've saved their time and they've saved my time. And so not that it's about, you know, how quickly can I get to my people, but there is some magic to be noted that when you can really truly just be the 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 realest representation of who you are one it's way less exhausting than holding up some stupid persona who has time for that but two you find your people so much faster and no one can do it alone embrace the fact that you need help that has just been so critical for me and i i love being able to cheer for other people that I work with. And even I was just chatting with Kaylee when we were in Aspen, my group of high school girlfriends, it's pretty rare that we've all stayed so close and we're all doing very big things in our own very separate world. And we never had this mean girl, you know, you've seen the movie, like we never had that with each other. We just truly were like, holy shit, you are doing it. You go get it. You get that new car. You install that pool. You like, we've just been so excited for each other. And I naively 
didn't realize that that's not how a lot of relationships are. That a lot of people have jealousy or envy or some of these like negative feelings professionally and personally. And I think the space that I've been able to create and nurture is one of just true appreciation, true valuing these friendships, true gratitude, truthfully showing up. It sounds so cheesy. Like I hear what I'm saying and it's not necessarily the most tangible thing, but leading with that genuine attitude has helped me connect with genuine people and those genuine people want to help me and I want to help them. It's, it's as simple as that. It has been as simple as that for me. Of course, hard work and talent, those all play a part as well. But when we're really talking about network and finding the right people, I think just leading with, you know, that authentic true self, which takes self-awareness and maybe some therapy and, you know, (laughs) maybe some self-development reading, you know, there are things that we can do to just really step into our truest self. But I've, I'm so grateful and proud of the work that I've done to get me where I am personally, because then I can make the right connections um, and interpersonal relationships from there. I love the authenticity side because it's, you know, as you speak to that, there's some truth to that. You know, it's interesting through social media, it's pretty easy that someone can have this persona and then maybe you think there's a certain way you meet them and you're like, well, that person's nothing like I thought they were. And maybe they're rude or condescending or, you know, or maybe they're even nicer or more approachable than you thought that they were from online. And it's easy to have this comparative status today where through social media, well, why is Sarah already with Prada? Why is she already, you know, has so many followers? Why does she have the success? And it's easy, this comparison. Did I take a left turn somewhere? You know, we started at the same time. Um, and it's easy to compare, but the, the ability to like cheer for success and have, you know, an authenticity and, 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 you know, I think there's a lot of just mental health there that really application yes. way outside of business. Yes. 100%. I, had therapy yesterday and was talking to my therapist (laughs) yesterday. And, you know, I, it was so fascinating because I said this, the last three weeks have just been this immense amount of learnings and this shift. And I, I looked at her and I said, the only difference, you know, I'm talking about some of these huge financial successes I've had lately that I just didn't even think were, those numbers were never a specific goal. Of course, I have like general numbers goals. And I want to be in the 2% of female business owners that make it to the six, uh, seven figure mark, excuse me, and beyond. Um, And I will do it. I don't have a doubt about it. And that's the difference between a you and a me and someone else. The simple belief that I can do it is what will make that happen for me. And not everyone has that. People have, you know, fear. I have fear too, but that fear doesn't stop me. People are, you know, self-conscious. I get self-conscious too, but that doesn't stop me. These, these things that from the outside looking in is, you know, what does Brad have that has made him so successful? What does Sarah have that has made her so successful? It's as simple as you and I believe that it's possible. That's it. And then we go make it happen, right? Like the hard work, the talent, building the team, et cetera the fact that we're both gregarious, right? Like those are skills and we've had privilege and there's other things, of course, but none of that would ever matter if we didn't truly believe that we could do it. And it is, it is just, it's, it's just truly as simple as that. I just believe I can. And then I put in the work and I go make it happen. It's such great advice. I mean, just believing in it. And and part of your job as a creative director, right, is you're working with brands and you know, that brand education, which I want to speak about because you're an expert in brand education, which a lot of people probably don't even know what a brand educator is. So we'll talk about that. But but essentially, you know, being able to to vision yourself, whether it's a vision board or a mental aptitude of here's where I want to go. I'm going to market to that. I'm going to build myself to that. I'm going to, you know, take these steps. I understand there's a process. You know, what is a brand educator? How do you work with a business that you're seeing maybe a struggle or an opportunity for growth? And now, Sarah, you're in charge to help them get to that point, especially with your creative agency that you own. For sure. What's so fascinating about my trajectory as to where 
I started and what I thought I wanted to do and what I'm doing now is I ended up really connecting with, I, I started in the wedding space. I wanted to be the, you know, stationer of the Minneapolis St. Paul marketplace. I wanted to make wedding stationery. And I quickly That's realized, so different than what you're doing now. <laughs> that's like, so different. That's not even close. It's so different. And from a design standpoint, you know, we talked about this in Huntington Beach. Design principles are design principles, right? So you understand composition and I understand composition and and you know, a, an interior designer understands balance and I understand balance. And we a photographer, same thing. But the application that we execute that on are all different mediums. You know, at the time I was executing on stationery, now I'm building brands. Um, you know, a photographer taking photos. So I quickly realized one that client wasn't the client I wanted forever. And two, I loved working with other entrepreneurs who were as crazy as me. There's something a little bit wild about us who think that against all odds, we can do it. That belief, that core belief I was talking about, that is rare. And because I've just innately, I think I just was born this way. I didn't realize how rare it was. I thought everyone thought that about their their beliefs and their abilities and that they could do it. And that's not the case. And entrepreneurs, though, small business owners, we have that. We have that common thread. And so it was really a study of working with people trying to get their ideas off the ground that led me to finding so many. It was, you know, it's like over a decade of market research. The problems are all the same across almost every brand. The issues, the concerns, the fears are all in alignment. And they might manifest in slightly different ways. But I found, oh my goodness, I've helped so many people solve these problems. I can distill this information down and help the masses figure that out. Not everyone has a budget to hire an agency. You remember what it was like when you got started. There's a lot of DIY that happens. There's a lot of being super scrappy and just getting started, which is what you have to do. Just start. Done is good enough sometimes until you can make it. Good is good enough sometimes. And then you can make it great is good enough sometimes. And then it's right. Like you have to take these baby steps. And so as a brand educator, I first and foremost want to empower and inspire to help business owners realize or side hustlers who are a little afraid or people in a full-time job that are like, I kind of want to step out of this, but I don't know. I want to really, you know, inspire and empower them to take that first step and prove I did it and I'm not special. You can do it too. You just have to believe that you can. Now, on the tangible standpoints, we provide a ton of free resources on our blog at heystarishult.com that literally help make those things happen. How do you pull together a mood board for your brand? What should your branding look like? What is branding? How do you speak to your dreamy client? Why is that important? Uh, to really help shape up the puzzle pieces that need to get plugged in that ultimately end up creating a brand experience. And that brand experience is what's really, really important for conversion. No one's trying to just put stuff out there to be cute. Like We're all trying to make money here. That's what this is about, right. closing sales. And your brand experience is such a paramount part of helping you close those sales. So this isn't just about like having a pretty face. This is about, you know, walking the walk, defining your values and ensuring that you're telling the best visual story to support all of those components, the complexity of what your brand is and what your brand stands for. This episode is brought to you by Pella Windows. When it comes to building homes at AFT, almost every project has Pella Windows. And they've been just an incredible partner of ours. And locally, Sammy and Adam, they are not only amazing business partners behind us, but they are super close friends. And I speak on the podcast all the time about the importance of relationships, right? Relationships with our customers, with our vendors, with our suppliers, because at the end of the day, I'm only as good as those that help our brand and assist us in our projects to, to take it from the ground up all the way to completion. And if we didn't have partners such as Pella, there's no way we'd be who we are today. 
Over the years, we've built this amazing relationship. When we call them or email them, they respond. They're quick. Their their company culture, their integrity, their honesty. You know, they are always there to do what's right for us and the customer. They can do anything from small replacement projects to large custom homes and even multi-million dollar commercial projects. And also, when you think about their product line, they can do ultra contemporary, historical preservation, and large traditional projects. So for anyone, any scale, any size, they're the ones to call. They're here local. You know, they have an amazing Instagram. Make sure and give them a follow to see what they're doing. So if you need windows and doors, give Sammy and Adam a call. We stand behind Pella. We love what they do, their culture, their brand, and especially their quality. And if you want to learn more about Pella Windows, check our show notes. We'll have everything tagged there so you can give them a follow and have their contact information to reach out. For those of you that have listened to the podcast, you know how big of a fan we are Build a Trend and that we have used this software for the last four years. And many of the guests that we've brought on the podcast are also Build a Trend users. And in this day and age, with as busy as all of us are in construction, as complicated as it is with escalation pricing, lead times, tracking, organization, all of us need a good project management software to help simplify and organize our business. And there are a couple features that we love a ton about Build a Trend. And one is the owner portal, the other is the daily logs. And these are features that we use daily, right? Half of my clients are out of state. And as an owner, it is so imperative how we communicate with our clients, with our team, with our customers. And through Build a Trend, this allows us that quick connection. They can check at any time. We can communicate with them. We're up to date. This has actually helped us win jobs, win projects because of that organization, especially at pre construction. And Build a Trend also offers a ton of service on the back end, training and understanding and workshops, you know, to help us use our software effectively. They also have the podcast, The Building Code. To learn more, head to buildertrend.com backslash AFT to get a 60 day money back guarantee on your Build a Trend account. That's 60 days to make sure you love this product with no pressure, and I know you will. So have you ever thought about, you know, because you put so much information, you're a thought leader there in the industry, and, and, and you're not opposed to putting all this content out there. Do you ever worry that it's going to impact, you know, the actual clientele that may come hire you, right? Because there's so much information. I would imagine, you know, especially as your company's evolved right now, you're going to work with some very sophisticated clients as you're doing. Um, you know, being a thought leader in the industry, how has that benefited you? That is such a great touch point because we actually very recently split the brands into two different businesses. So really, you know, what is it? 2022 right now? 20, what yeah. year is it? 2022. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's such a whirlwind, right? You just got in from so, Aspen. So it's like, <laughs> I, it's like, I don't know. I, I'm still lacking a little oxygen to the brain. Um, we actually client facing only launched free afternoon, which is the name of the agency. It at the end of 2020 and we knew really quickly that my goals for the one-on-one -on -one client work and my goals for my presence on Instagram and what is still HeySarahSchultz.com, which was what client work was running under, were starting to split and that was causing confusion in the marketplace. People were loving the free content and people were loving the courses and people were loving, I had a, a group coaching program and then it was not translating well to, well, wait, does she also execute these things or is she just teaching on these things? Does she do these things with clients or is she just talking about these things? And that was really, people ask all the time, when should I rebrand or when should I look at, you know, having a brand evolution? And that is one of the the amazing touch points. It's not a timeline. It's a transition. I, I had goals that were shifting my client work and goals that were shifting the other demographic I wanted to nurture. And those were two different people. And in order to create clarity, clarity is what helps close that sales funnel, get you there faster. I needed to re-message for the one-on-one -on -one client work and pull one-on-one -on -one client work away from who I was talking to, the different demographic I was talking to specifically on Instagram. And we ended up having two separate businesses. Now, if you think about the client base, an Aspen X, a Prada, they don't have the time to invest in figuring it out. They have the, the money to invest in having somebody do it for them. So I don't have any concerns on like, sure, that team can go read all of my free information. The reality is that's not their goal. 
that's not their bread and butter. They're not trying to teach themselves to do it themselves. Their job is to create this luxury brand and build incredible tech ski wear and do all these other things, right? Be a fashion house, be a luxury product. They're going to bring in partners to help with the other touch points that they see gaps in. That's what we and who we serve at Free Afternoon. At HeySarahSchultz.com, that client does not have the budget to hire someone. They are not ready to invest dollars, but they have another currency called time. And they're willing to invest their time currency into figuring out, okay, I'm going to read up all on all this information. It might take me longer to execute this, but I don't have the luxury of spending cash. I don't have the capital. But that doesn't mean I don't want to do it. And it would be easy for me to just walk away from that second demographic who I serve at HeySarahSchultz.com because financially it's just not even comparable to what we're doing at Free Afternoon. But I have such a passion and empathy for the person who wants to come to HeySarahSchultz.com because that's how I started. That's who I was. I was afraid. I wasn't sure. I walked into a room and I assumed everyone had a secret that I didn't know. And I was like, how do I learn what you know? There isn't a secret. It's just everyone has to figure out what works for them and their client. And so by me arming that demographic and helping that, again, mostly women are consuming on that platform. I I truly believe I'm empowering and impacting the community for more women in business to step out and follow their dreams for more women to have financial freedom, for more women to achieve these things that the data is clear and we can talk about glass ceiling and we can talk about pay gaps and we can talk about these things. I'm hoping to empower business owners across the board, but especially women in business to take control. Go make it happen, girlfriend. You can do it. You totally can do it. I love that you shared that. And I love the the women empowerment side too, Sarah. I mean, I have five daughters, so I I just have a deep appreciation for that. Yeah. And and what's what's amazing about it though is that as I break that apart, a couple of things you were mentioning is one, there's clarity. So I, as you were speaking of kind of about the two businesses, hey Sarah, Sarah Schultz and Free Afternoon, you know, I'm thinking early in my career, it's like, well, when I started my company, we get it. You know, you're doing a remodel, you're doing a patio, doing a backsplash, and people are like, Brad, well, if you do that, why don't you market that? And it's like, well. Ideally, I kind of know the goal I want to go. I want to market to like what I where my expertise is. But yes. there's two parts to this. But the way you broke it down, Sarah, that's interesting is that you never know. And this goes back to early on when I asked you about networking and, and passion and, you know, how do you make these connections? What's interesting is that for people to be successful, um, you, you know, I use the term silent salesman, silent salespeople, right? That sell your brand art on your payroll. But you're going to have a bunch. You're going to have, because of Hey Sarah Schultz, especially on the female side, a ton of these female entrepreneurs are building their business that are going to be, you know, advocates for you and your business. And you never know who they're going to connect with that are looking, they could have a connection that's looking for an agency and they're like, hey, you know what? Go to Sarah. And so you have people that are selling your brand because you've been an ally for them. You've been a resource for them. And so you're using this and it may not be a huge financial thing, but the empowerment, right, for the the female side and the female entrepreneur and then how that could also become a possible lead generator. And that's what a lot of people overlook is that not only are you giving back, but it all comes around full circle at some point. Totally. And think about it. Some of those women who have consumed the free content or my low price point products, they're going to make it. Yeah. They're going to need a rebrand. And then they'll call they're you. Gonna need, and they're going to call me. And so not only do I love being able to encourage them and inspire and show, you know, the the big message coming out of this Aspen X Prada shoot on my personal side, outside of the cool work we're doing is you can build a family and build a business at the same time. If that's what you want to do, you don't have to pick one or the other. If you don't want to choose one or the other, if you want to pause career to invest in family, I love that for you. If you want to pause family to invest in career, that's fantastic. But you can also do both at the same time. And just by me modeling that, because that's what I want to do, I really am hopeful that other women are like, oh my gosh, yeah, okay, I can do that as well. And and get after it. I just, there's some really sad statistics about how the, it's, it's like 80, I have to, we, we'll fact check this, right? But like 80 some percent of people are unhappy in their career, are unhappy in their job. That's way too many people. Crazy. Imagine if we just had happy people that you're spending most of your time at work. Like, don't you think that joy and happiness would spill over into every aspect of life? It just, 
it blows my mind. It, it just, it blows my mind that we don't have people that are taking risks or chances or choosing change to step into something that makes them happy. And if I can just simply model that, hopefully there's a ripple effect that comes. And I believe that there will be. I truly believe that there will be that whether I know it or not, somebody's making a decision that's better for them and that's going to create happiness for them. And then when they run into someone at Starbucks and they spill their coffee and instead of screaming at them, they're just like, I'm so sorry, it's not a big deal. Let me help you clean that up. Those little small ripples make such big impact at the end. And, you know, it could start because they read a free blog post. I don't know. But, you know, hopefully I'm able to, to impact in that way. Well, I love that. And the reality is the ripple effect. You just have no idea where those leads come. And so the more that you're being an advocate, you know, out on that platform, you know, it's so beneficial to everybody. So from your side, Sarah, how do you vet clients? Because you, you mm. deal with the similar thing I do, vetting clients, you know, and making sure are they right? Are their visions the same? You know, price, expectation, deliverables. I mean, there's a lot that goes from your side where it's pretty easy. I shouldn't say easy because I'm not a creative person, but from your side, I would imagine it's very complex to create a brand and rebrand, whether there's so many elements to that. And where a client can maybe become frustrated or disappointed. I mean, how do you bridge that gap and vet the client before they hire on with, um, you know, free afternoon? I have a discovery call. It's 30 minutes. And within the first five minutes, I know if they're my person or if they're not my person. So how do you know in five minutes? In five minutes. I am a, uh, I'm a gut person. I can, I can feel it. It's something that's probably taken years to hone. Um, but it's a lot, it has a lot to do with how they approach the conversation. You can tell if someone is like energetic and ready to go. I have on my website, and I don't think this is right for every brand, by the way, uh, but on my website, I have starting at prices. And so they can see the level that they're about to step into if they're hopping on a call with me. And one, that vets a lot of people right away. At my price point, we are eliminating the fear of investment. They've already decided like, I have this money to invest. It just comes down to the right person. So that's kind of like a behind the scenes thing that has really worked well for me is we're immediately kind of, you know, helping those clients that don't have that money to invest. They're self-selecting out, saving their time and saving my time. That's been a really value added com component of how we push people through our user experience on the website and then into through our sales funnel. Um, a couple other things that help me understand is how quickly from when they fill out our form to following up when we say, hey, we'd like to book a call, how quick are they willing to hop on the phone with us? If there's a ho-hum-ha happening, I can already kind of tell before that five minutes, like, are you really invested in you? Because you got to be invested in you before you're going to invest in me. Uh, I definitely do a little scoping on social media, if, especially if it's a brand that's been like it's a totally a cold lead. Most of my referrals that are coming in, we still drive them to the website to go through our process because it helps keep us organized. Those are those back-end systems that I was talking about. There's a flow that happens there from the get-go when they fill out a form from our site. Um, but if it's a cold lead and somebody I'm not familiar with or it's not through a referral, I'll do a little digging and I'll say, okay, do I see you investing in yourself already? Do I see you committing to your growth? When most of my clients are going through a rebrand, it's something that they built themselves. They're probably still the founder and they're stepping from founder to CEO. Most of my clients, a founder and a CEO are two very different people, two very different roles in a brand. And founders, I'm a founder. I, my business is my baby. I love my business. That is very, that's a very different person. And sometimes founders have a hard time letting people in, listening for expertise. So it's little, it's little things like that, that, that are really apparent within the first five minutes. Are you speaking to me with energy? Do I hear you excited about the project? Or are you bringing a lot of, you know, junky fear and mess? You're not ready for the process. Even if you're ready for the investment, you're not ready for the process. That's not going to make us successful. And so trying to pick up on some of those cues really helps me understand if this is going to be a good fit. Because as a creative, I can't have stifling. I can't have controlling. It's just I'm not going to – that doesn't allow me and my team to have that creative flow state 
that is so important for us. This is design is so unique because it's not a math problem where two plus two equals four every single time. I have an infinite number of answers that I have to hone down to one solution for a client. That's really hard to do. And so if you have someone breathing down your neck or if you have someone that's like really antsy, that just stifles the whole creative process and it muddles the whole thing. So really picking up on some of that energy is very important for me early on because we will not be successful together. And that's important. This is about both of us being successful, right? I want to deliver the best product and experience possible so that my business owners, my founders, my CEOs can have their best brand possible. The stakes are high. And so that vetting process is pretty important. So how this part's interesting because as you're working with CEOs and founders or founders that, you know, are becoming the CEO, you know, they're emotionally attached to their business as we all are. You know, they've created their business. They've worked hard. They've built it. They have a brand. As you mentioned, they may have come up with their own brand. Um, how tough is it to emotionally uh, have them disengage to turn that over to you when this has been their baby for so long? I have not had problems with that. That's and amazing. I think it's because. I show up very truthfully from the beginning and that expectation is just already understood from interacting with me, from seeing the website. They've probably scoped my personal accounts or they've gone, they've hopped over to HeySarahSchultz.com or they've had some interaction with me or let's not underestimate the power of a referral based business. Most of my leads are through my network. It's, they're not cold leads coming because of SEO. They're not cold leads just finding me on Instagram. Those clients have explained, Sarah gets it. She understood what I needed and made it happen. She saw what was in my head when I couldn't, and she was worth every penny. Those words speak volumes time and time again. And going back to shortening that sales funnel, that helps the right people come to me that that's what they want. They want to find a true partner they can trust. And they wanted to say, like, Sarah, just go make it happen. Go make it happen. And I'm able to do that every time. It's so amazing. And I just love that, you know, the confidence you have and especially the, the ability to get connect with someone emotionally and, and not have any pushback. It just shows to the creative side and, and talent you have, Sarah. Um, Thank you. When a company's looking, is there a difference between maybe male or female focus, right, as you're thinking about branding? Do you take into consideration the entity? Do you take into consideration mm. um, maybe the environment they're working in or who they're selling to? The reason I bring that up, what's interesting about the construction is, you know, uh, uh, we do have a lot of female decision makers. I mean, they really do. And 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 they're really involved. It's very common that in a lot of my builds, right, that the females are really involved with the design process and the selections and the actual build, right? Point of contact with a lot of my builds is the female is, so do you take into consideration the environment that the company's in when looking at that brand strategy? 100%. So that would be the demographic of the client that we're really focusing on. What's fascinating about consumer spending right now is historically, you know, in a heterosexual household, the male was making all of the financial decisions and, you know, the female was like, okay, like maybe it wasn't even a consultation that was happening, right? Like that has within the last 10 years really taken a pivot where for a while it was much more 50-50. Now, statistically, women at home are the ones making the financial decisions. They might, I, I, I want to say the latest statistic I read was like a 60-40 split. So we're still not talking about like a huge difference, but What's happening is that even if your interaction, and again, I'm making vast assumptions here, right? I don't yeah, know and you're talk- everyone who's yeah. listening. Right. I'm talking broad, right? I'm talking broad. Yep. What's interesting about that is even if the male is writing the check or it's his credit card, the consultation that happened behind the scenes that as business owners we might not see was heavily influenced. And now, for one of the first times in history, most influenced by a female voice and a female perspective. Regardless of your industry, knowing that is extremely important because things that help a woman make decisions are very different than things that help a male make decisions. And so 
when it comes to how we're positioning clients, that's oftentimes like my clients, that's oftentimes a conversation I have is, you know, I want to challenge the reality that even if your main point of contact is a male counterpart or a male client, he's not making these decisions alone anymore. He's consulting with a partner who might have a little more say than what historically has happened. So that's very, very important for all of all of my client base to really understand um, so that when we're assessing their clients, I can help ensure that we're setting them up for success on the visual story front and how are we marketing to them. Um, and then of course, there's like generational differences to who you're targeting and why you're targeting them. And the reality that millennials are stepping into having cash to spend on services now is real. Obviously, millennials are getting older. They're more established. Um, that's different than Gen X. That's different than the boomer generation. They value very, very different things. And so the most successful businesses, especially businesses that have been standing and in business for a long time, are realizing that their client is about to change and their expectations, the, the, their clients' expectations are potentially different than ever before. I mean, just even look at the impact of social media on, on business. That's, that has been such a game changer for so many business owners, those who have adopted it and those who have chosen not to adopt it. And as a business owner, that's your choice. You get to decide how you're going to serve and, and why you want to serve them. Not everyone has to be on social media, but look at what has happened for those that are leveraging a free tool businesses have skyrocketed because of that. It's interesting. I mean, there's just so much free to manage. I just am always admire business owners such as yourself, Sarah, where I think, I, I know my business is complex, but I look at yours and I'm like, you have such a vast clientele, right? From different industries and you're trying to understand different demographics. And you mentioned like a heterosexual couple, you know, now it's the, the pendulum swayed where the females making more decisions. You know, how do you stay just current to understand, especially with so many markets and clients that are working in so many different industries to make sure you're capturing, you know, that right brand. I actually really love studying pop culture and spending time on social media platforms and paying attention to what's happening in the marketplace. Um, you know, it's, it's fun for me to see these changes and these evolutions. The thing that I really want business owners to realize is that maintaining a resilience and being adaptable is going to be key forever because of technology things change so quickly so you know we do help clients with social media presence i never will say that i'm an expert in social media how can you be an expert in something that changes every other month you can't but you need to be open and aware and willing to continue to learn as everything changes. And so I find that to be so fascinating that technology is expanding as quickly as it is and it is forcing consumers, business owners or not, to make epic changes in how we live our lives, how we run our businesses. I think that that's pretty cool. And so just, I think just being aware and open and curious has really helped me continue to serve my clients. Um, to ensure that that we're achieving what the goals are, asking questions, not pretending like I have all the answers, saying, yeah, we can figure that out, and then going and figuring it out. It's, it's always being willing to learn has truly helped ensure that I'm able to serve our clients in the best way possible. Well, I think a there's good some ego sound check, advice. maybe. Yeah, a, a good, good ego, ego check, check there. <laughs> but but the point there is willingness to learn, right? That's something. The continuing education is something we should all be doing in each of our fields. So outside of all the craziness that we speak, spoke about today, Sarah, what do you do for fun? Oh, my goodness. Well, I've got a toddler at home. So everything is fun and exciting through a two and a half year old's eyes from today. He put his underwear on by himself. That was just <laughs> joy filled moment. Mommy, I found the holes. He was so excited that it's crazy. I wasn't sure I wanted to be a mom and getting to see the world through his little eyes is it's so I, you get it. You've done it five times. It's just, it is really, really cool. Uh, I try really hard to stay connected with my girlfriends when I'm not pregnant. I love a good cocktail. <laughs> I love traveling. I went to ASU, so I know Scottsdale and Tempe and the Phoenix area, and I miss it so, so much. So I would love to be able to get back down there and enjoy some of my old stomping grounds and hang out. And 
I just, you know what? I really like to fill my days with whatever makes me happy. And sometimes that's just like a bubble bath and a glass of wine. And sometimes that's, you know, going on an adventure. It just, whatever I can do to, to kind of fill my cup, I'm, I'm always open to exploring what that could be. Well, I love that. I would say what's upcoming and exciting, but I don't know how you top Prada. So (laughs) I know we got to see, well, we're going back. The team and I are going back to, to Aspen, it sounds like. So that's, I'm really excited about that. Uh, I hear you've got some conferences coming up. I would love to officially put my name in the hat to be, a, to be a speaker there. I love sharing knowledge. I mean, that group that you, Morgan, and Nick curated was just so – those are the people, the people that were in that room. Like, Brad, I'm, I'm so serious. I wasn't sure what I was about to walk into. And I knew it was going to be, I knew it was going to be good because I know Morgan, right? And I know Morgan personally, I know you, um, I hadn't met Nick yet, but I walked into that room and I was so excited by the capacity, by the level and, and the passion of the people that you three really, you know, compelled and curated to bring into that space. And so I'm working with some of those people now, which is very exciting, um, but that was a ton of fun. Those are that's a good spot as we talk about networking. That's a good A plus spot to meet the people who believe that they can do it. And I don't have a doubt. Those are the people in that room that are going to go make it happen. Well, to Sarah's point, so the, you're speaking of the Contractor Coalition Summit that we've had, you know, one event in Nashville and then Huntington Beach, which you attended. And I'm sure you'll be attending in Scottsdale when we're hosting in May. So sounds I'll give like it, I have to. It sounds like you have to, and especially being that this is your old stomping ground. But um, but what's neat from that is, yeah, as you mentioned, a lot of them are working with you because these are people that get it. They want to better their business. They want to, you know, and, and as you said a couple times, you know, the road as an entrepreneur can be really lonely. And so... It's nice to have people to collaborate and network with. And, uh, you know, for those listening, because I can attest, I know Sarah, she does an amazing job. Her energy is unmatched. Her talent's unmatched, as you can see from this interview. Where can our listeners find you? You can find me at com on Instagram at HeySarahSchultz. The agency is FreeAfternoon.co and on Instagram at FreeAfternoon. Amazing. Well, I'll get those tagged. And Sarah, can't thank you enough. I know you just landed from Aspen, so thank you for making time. (laughs) Heck yeah, Brad. I appreciate it. Good to see you again. So thank you all for tuning into the podcast today. And just as a recap, if you check the show notes, they're just going to have all the links for the topics that we discuss. And also one of our favorite features now is the chapters that go through the conversation. So if there's certain topics you want to revisit or listen to, they're outlined by the time that we discuss those. And again, we can't thank you enough for all of your support. Please make sure and download our podcast, subscribe, give us a five-star rating and review wherever you download your podcast.